Oh my God, Jeff, what's with the tie? Please tell me you don't have a job interview. No, I'm, I'm dressing for success. I thought we were talking about photographer fashion. No, oh, no, my friend, we're talking about dressing for success in the outdoors. Oh, wait, like outside? Like outside my house? You want me to leave my house? Yeah, you can do it. Uh, it's okay, I promise. Then I'm gonna need some pants. <laughs> yeah, and socks, shoes, a coat, maybe even a hat. Oh, thank God, I can take off this tie. Did you know that the top button is supposed to fasten? I can't breathe. Photographers spend a lot of time thinking about their gear. Today, we're gonna to think about what we wear when we head out to take photos. Spring, summer, fall, winter, there's some seriously high-tech clothing that will keep you comfortable no matter what the weather. It's time to photocombobulate outdoor clothing. I'm Mason Marsh. And I'm Jeff Carlson, and I love this puffy coat. So Jeff, it is the beginning of June as this episode airs, and I'm getting ready for some big trips. Uh, you've got some plans for the summer. We're actually going to go camping together here in a couple of weeks. And it's yeah. the time of year where I really start to think about the clothing that I'm going to be taking out with me. And it's not just the winter time, right? Every time of year, there's some sort of weather that you have to dress for. And as photographers, um, I don't think a lot of photographers spend enough time thinking about the clothes that they bring with them when they head outside. Yeah. Well, we all have clothes, right? And, and typically when you're, when you're getting dressed, okay, maybe this is just me. When you're getting dressed, you're thinking about what the day is going to be like and you grab, you know, whatever you need. And, and that's, that's kind of it. Uh, however, you know, photography puts you in all sorts of different extremes. I mean, right now wearing this puffy coat, which I'm going to take off shortly because otherwise I'm going <laughs> to bake in here in this office. <laughs> but uh, this reminds me of when we were at Crater Lake and it was what, I think 21 degrees and mm -hmm. windy. And we had, I think almost every layer that I owned that I brought on that trip, uh, I put on, put to good use and I was able to, you know, do photography in super cold, snowy, windy weather. But then we got in the car and we headed south into California. And I think within a few hours, it was in the low 80s or high 70s. Yeah, it was and hot. And so, <laughs> you know, it was warm. If, if I had just planned for that day, thinking about what I was going to do in the morning, or just thinking about like what a regular day would be in Oregon and Northern California, I would have frozen in the morning and baked in the afternoon and been miserable and hated the experience. And that, I mean, we can tell all sorts of stories about seeing people who are not prepared trying to make photos and just being miserable. Absolutely. Yeah. I, thousands of stories, right? Including us. I've, I've certainly been in oh, situations yeah. where I was underdressed and not prepared for the conditions. And I think that uh, th there's so much technology that's out there now for us uh, when it comes to outdoor clothing and getting to know this technology, just like we would a uh, new camera and new lenses is going to put us in a position to be successful when we head outside, because it's hard to be creative when you're miserable. It's hard to be a great photographer when you're soaking wet and cold or boiling hot and sweaty. So let's yeah. break down um, the clothing that we would suggest people bring with them for different seasons and for different situations or for days like we you were talking about where it starts out real cold and uh, ends up being real warm in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and sorry. And, and you know, one thing that I want to point out here is I love the fact that right off the bat, you were talking about technology because I do not think of technology when I think of clothing. I think of layers and I think of something that, that's either thicker or thinner. Mm -hmm. And so you're really going to largely lead this discussion because you have a lot more knowledge about all these like, you know, different types of technologies, all these fabrics that just were unheard of 
you know, decades ago. Right. And, and, you know, granted, I am not a fashion guy. I do not spend a whole lot of, of brain space on what I wear or what I buy. I mean, I'm a freelance writer. Come on. Uh, so I'm not aware of all this kind of stuff. And I think a lot of people might be the same way. They're just like, well, as long as I have a jacket, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Or as, lo as long as I have like four layers, I'm fine. But the types of layers make a huge difference because then, you know, maybe it's, maybe you're too bulky. Maybe you have packed too much and you have to get a larger suitcase because, you know, like all of these things. So that, I think the technology part that you mentioned, I'm really glad you said that because I'm looking forward to that part of the discussion. Yeah, and it's it's really, um, I want to talk about this as a system. When we talk about dressing for outdoor activities, we need to think about, you know, starting at skin level and moving out as this stuff as a system because they're designed, the technology involved is designed to work together. Um, and if you break the break the system, it's not going to work. And so, uh, you know, we're both Northwesterners. We, you grew up in Idaho. I grew up in Eastern Washington. And now we live on the wet sides of uh, <laughs> our respective states. And I'm always amazed, even though we're in the Northwest, you know, home of REI and all these great stores to buy this stuff. I'm amazed at how many people in the Northwest think a cotton hoodie is appropriate storm wear <laughs> or, yes. you know, some plastic raincoat is appropriate for, for wearing on a, on a rainy day. And so I want to talk about, um, you know, the technology involved, but I also want to talk about how the, these systems work together. And I think this is really important uh, want to address this to the specific needs of photographers, because our use is different than someone who's going backpacking or skiing um, mm -hmm. or, or running or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. We are in a situation where we tend to be um, high output. So I'm going to use this term high output when we're getting to our location. So we're hiking, we've got our big heavy camera bag on our backs so and we've got a tripod and we're trudging up some mountain trail somewhere trying to get to this beautiful location. And maybe we're running late. Usually we're chasing the light. So maybe we're, go we're pushing ourselves a little harder than we would if we were just on a casual hike. And usually when you arrive at your location, you're pretty, pretty warm, pretty steamed up. And that then you're going to stop and stand and, and loiter for maybe an hour or two. That is different mm -hmm. than just about any other out outdoor activity um, where either you're just a high output all the time or low output all the time. So we have right. to kind of mix things up a little bit as photographers and think about both modes of existence outside. So let's start uh, building this system. Let's start at skin level and okay. talk about the technology uh, that we put against our skin. And then we're going to move out from there and, and we'll end with uh, the really cool jackets and the, sh the boots and all of that good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> also, <laughs> this is also like the, the dark side of gear acquisition syndrome. <laughs> where... Yeah. <laughs> this is like, just like just photographers, like man, yep. bags, yep. cameras, lenses, coats. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure you only have one coat and maybe one hoodie that you have ever purchased in your time. Right. right. Yeah. No, I have one closet right. full of these things. So <laughs> um, I do, I do want to say that we're going to be going through a lot of stuff here and talking about a lot of different types of clothes in the show notes for this episode at photocombobulate.com. Uh, you're going to be able to find a full list, a full breakdown. I'll do a, a breakdown of all this stuff. So you don't have to write anything down. You can go find links and all that good stuff later. Um, just to sit back and enjoy. Excellent. All right. So let's start against the skin. Um, right now I'm wearing a cotton t-shirt, which is almost always what I'm wearing when I'm here at home. Uh, very comfortable. Uh, most of us, we just throw on some sort of cotton t-shirt. Uh, and a lot of people like to wear things like jeans and things like that, that are real heavy cotton. Cotton is incredibly comfortable in moderate conditions. And it's a really, uh, fabulous, you know, fabric, but when you go outside and you get out and you start sweating or you're out in a rainy or wet environment, cotton is absolutely horrible. It's the last <laughs> thing you want to be wearing. And so I'm going to start by saying right off the bat, cotton kills. Cotton is a big problem when it comes to outdoor activities and uh, from socks to hats and everything in between, if it's cotton, it's going to get wet and it's going to be uh, miserable for you. So just 
set all your, leave all your cotton stuff aside, save it for um, hanging around at home or hanging around at, you know, at camp or going to lunch or whatever. When we're dealing with the, the, the activities involved with outdoor photography, we're going to use mostly synthetics. The only natural fiber that really works well in these situations is, is wool, specifically merino wool. So we can include that, but cotton, uh, cotton's not good. So my cotton t-shirt that I'm wearing right now, I'm not going to wear that, uh, in cold, wet, or even hot, uh, environments. I'm just going to skip that and go with a synthetic base layer. So my underwear, my socks, my, my skivvies, my t-shirt is going to be some sort of synthetic or merino wool material that will wick moisture away from my skin. Its job is to transport the sweat that I produce and move it off of my skin. And this may be obvious, Jeff, and it's worth mentioning though. Um, when you sweat, the job of that sweat is to evaporate and cool you off. But if it just gets into your clothes and sits there, um, it, it doesn't evaporate. It doesn't cool you off. So in hot climates, it doesn't help. And in cold climates, it cools you off too much and you end up getting, you know, hypothermic. So start with a synthetic base layer that wicks moisture away from your skin and takes it to the outer layers of your clothes where it can evaporate and you can get rid of it. And you don't have to sit there with, with clammy um, shorts on, which is, which is no fun. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and you know, this goes against my, um, you know, my basic thoughts of, you know, if, if I'm in a cold environment, my first inclination is to put on all these warm things, um, you know, and so my, my first question to this is uh, socks, particularly, right? If I have some, some socks, and I know it's going to be cold, do you put on multiple socks? What do you do? I mean, I'm going to say this as, as someone who honestly, like, I don't notice if my feet get sweaty or too hot or anything like that. I'll notice my, if, if my feet get cold. Right. Um, but, but I do know that some people, you know, like their feet get hot and that's super uncomfortable, in which case a synthetic would be good. But if it's cold and I just have like one synthetic pair of socks, then am I screwed? <laughs> no, not, a, not at all. Not at all. If you have cotton socks, you're screwed. Right. So okay. look at the socks you buy, even if it's a cotton blend, there's enough, if there's more than like 2% cotton in there, you're in trouble. Um, so I would suggest strongly urge that any socks that you wear outside uh, be merino wool. Just that's the, that's the okay. substance for socks. The reason for that is um, the other alternative is some sort of plastic, right? Polypropylene, um, polyester, some sort of spun nylon fiber. The problem with those mm -hmm. is uh, the nylon, the plastic retains, <laughs> it's going to be gross, retains odor really, really well. And so totally. even if you wash them, they, they'll stink forever. So stay away from uh, anything that's, you know, I, I encourage you to have synthetics on, but in this particular case, it, you can't beat merino wool for, uh, for its power to produce nice warm feet move moisture off of your feet out into your footwear um, and also not be nasty and foul once everything gets a little stinky. The other thing that's great about merino wool is it's not really crushable. The socks that merino wool um, are woven from tend to be really well engineered so that they provide cushioning so you don't get blisters. Because once your socks get wet, uh, most materials, especially cotton, right, will compress down and become kind of hard. And that's where your feet start to rub against that. And mm -hmm. that's where you get blisters and you have all kinds of problems. So having a material that's going to be soft uh, and keep its softness, even if it's wet, is, is really, really important. Now, your question about multiple pairs of socks, in some situations, it's, it's good to have a liner sock, which is a really lightweight uh, sock that, that kind of clings to your skin. And then another sock on the outside that's thicker. I don't like to do that though, because it, you have to be really careful that your footwear is sized to accommodate layers of socks. So if you're normally wearing those boots or those shoes with regular socks, and then you throw on two pair, now you might be crushing your feet and causing blisters or you'll have hot spots. And so I think that the modern merino wool socks, because of the way they're woven, they have an inner looped kind of soft 
um, face to them that goes against your skin and then an outer more durable face that goes against your boot or your shoe, they really do the job of two socks and they can, you can vary the thickness depending on the temperature and, and be good. So I'm a one mm -hmm. pair of socks kind of person. So that's okay. That's it. That's all you need to say probably about socks. <laughs> now that said, um, even merino wool, once they get wet, they do start to lose their ability to keep you warm. So uh, being able to change your socks, if you're out for a very long day, it's not a bad idea to bring an extra pair of socks in your bag, you know, just to, just to have a spare in case you get drenched. Even the most waterproof boots get, you get wet inside because your feet sweat. Right. So yeah. um, it's, it's not a bad idea if you're going to be out for a long day to, to plan on switching out socks. So let's move up the body a little bit. So up from socks, we're going to go to our underwear. Um, I'm a big fan of synthetics. Now there there's Merino wool underwear out there. That's fabulous, but really expensive. Um, you're paying a lot yeah. for Merino wool. It is the best fabric for, um, for this application, but it's, tends to be cost prohibitive for most people. So I suggest a nice lightweight uh, synthetic, not a cotton synthetic blend, not your normal uh, everyday city wear underwear, but performance mm -hmm. underwear that's designed to move um, moisture off of your skin. So that's um, going to do the job of keeping your uh, private parts <laughs> <laughs> nice and dry and, and comfortable because that's I, I can't think of anything more um, more uncomfortable than being soggy down there. Ugh. And again, if you're uncomfortable, you're not going to be making good <clears throat> photos because you're going to be like, uh, I'm uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been I've been in situations where I've gotten hit by waves and been real wet um, from there down, and it's your your part of your brain is always thinking about that, and you're not thinking about your work very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So mo moving yeah. up from the underwear, the base layer that you put on the top of your body, your upper, um, usually is a t-shirt of some sort, and it could be a long sleeve t-shirt, short sleeve t-shirt, but this is a really light layer and it's, uh, can be merino wool. It can be a synthetic, but it's, it's needs to be light so that it will transport the moisture off your skin. It needs to be kind of tight fitting. So that should transport the moisture off of your skin and get it to the med the mid layer or to the outer layer. Now in a hot climate, um, you know, it's, uh, you're hot and you're sweaty. You want to move that sweat to the outer layer so it can evaporate and cool you down. Uh, that outer layer might be this base layer, right? That may be all you're wearing. And in the case mm -hmm. of a synthetic t-shirt, its ability to pull that moisture off your skin and get it to the outer fibers of that shirt so it can evaporate is going to, going to quickly cool you down. It's going to be really nice. In the case of wearing multiple layers, and I do this all the time when I'm out taking photos is I'll show up at the um, point where I want to take my photos and I'll get my tripod and my camera all set up. And hopefully I've got a few minutes to do this. I'll unzip my jackets, uh, you know, my insulating layers and my shell layers, and I'll let my base layer breathe, <laughs> get it open to the air. Mm. And I'm going to basically pump out all that moisture and all that hot, it, that, that heat that I built up inside my, my clothes. That way, that moisture isn't sitting there against my skin. And once I'm sort of dried off, I can zip back up and I'm ready to stay warm. But because this is a system, we have to keep in mind that this job of this base layer is to move moisture out. If we trap it and don't let it out, it's it's not able to do anything. It's, it's not doing its work. Yeah. So that's... Uh, <laughs> You know, all of this is, is kind of creepy to think about, you know, our body pumps out a tremendous amount of moisture when we're exerting ourselves and, you know, think about where that goes is, is kind of, uh, kind of gross now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, I mean, I, I'm thinking back, uh, not to just continually reference the, the photo experiences we've had, but I guess that's mm -hmm. what I'm going to do now. Um, you know, when we were at, um, when we were in in the Sierras, and you know, started a day um, when we were at the uh, uh, oh crap, what what are the rocks there? Uh, Alabama Hills. The Alabama Hills. When yep. we were at the Alabama Hills, you know, it, it, it we started early, early in the morning before dawn. It was very cold. I had many layers, but as soon as that sun came up, everything started warming up pretty quickly, and. Uh, maybe you're also going to get to this, but um, it was very nice to be able to have like my my puffy coat 
uh, and a couple layers that I could just crush down really easily and stow in a bag or tie around right. my waist because, you know, at, the, at that point, I'm solely thinking about photography, about light, about composition, and it just did not want to deal with where where's my clothing, mm -hmm. how uncomfortable I am, because if I spend too much time thinking about that, then the light is gone and then I'm frustrated. Right. And yeah. So this stuff shouldn't be a distraction, right? We, we oftentimes talk about uh, mitigating distractions in our, in our podcast. And so yeah. this is a classic example. And I think that morning in the Alabama Hills, you know, we started out uh, up at Mount, up at the up our campground, up at the Mount Whitney portal, and it was cold. It was really cold. And so we were really bundled cold. up and we got down to uh, the Valley floor where the Hills were. And as soon as that sun came up, it jumped like 20 degrees. It was quite warm. And I remember, yeah. you know, those layers came off and, and that's really important. We're talking about this system and we're starting with the base layer. Uh, you need to be able to remove these layers easily. So if your system is just one layer and you either get to choose be, you know, freezing cold or boiling hot, um, you're limiting your, your utility. You're limiting how much you can mitigate your discomfort and your distraction. Yeah. So, um, one of the things I'll talk about here next is mid layers. And so having multiple layers so that you can adjust during the day or adjust during the, the, the moment. Um, because like I said, you know, you're, you're working hard, you're getting to your location, you're going to get really warm. Uh, you want to dry off and you're going to get cold because you're standing still, you're going to put those layers back on. So being able to pop them on and off, uh, let them dry out really quickly, really important. So let's talk about the mid layer. Uh, when we're down at our legs, um, I'm a shorts guy. I wear shorts almost year round. So my legs don't really get cold unless it's really super windy and cold. And so uh -huh. for me, a mid layer is, is not something I normally wear on my legs. It's either um, shorts or pants, <laughs> nothing in between. So uh, what I'll do in a situation where it's cold is I'll be wearing my underwear and I'll put some warm pants over that. Maybe they're a shell pants or a, a soft shell, which is a material that's got a little bit of insulation to it, um, but it's also sort of weather resistant. So they're not rain pants necessarily, but they're, they're going to work in most conditions and they're going to breathe because our leg muscles yeah. are what's doing a lot of the work when we're out moving around to, to make photos. So being able to keep your leg muscles from overheating is important. Thus, I, you know, the reason I like my shorts, but um, the pants that I really like for getting out there and hiking around, maybe you're in the brush and you don't want to wear shorts. Maybe it's cold and you want to have that layer over your legs. I really like um, just a good, strong, either soft shell or a, a, a nice, comfortable uh, synthetic pant. And one of my favorite pairs of pants is a really kind of expensive. They're a bit of an investment, but they're made by Fall Raven, which is a Swedish clothing brand. Uh, and they're a combination of stretchable soft shell material and uh, waxed ca uh, canvas. <laughs> and so the parts oh. of the pants that are going to get in contact with the ground, like the knees or the butt, um, those have this kind of weatherproof material on them. And then the rest of the pants are stretchy and breathable so that I can stay somewhat cool. Um, I'm doing high output activities. And I really like those. Those are kind of an all purpose, uh, very strong. You're, you can take these to really rough brush. They're not going to get all torn up. Uh, so I think those are a, a great option. Any other, um, you know, if it's wet or if it's snowy or something like that, you're obviously going to bulk up and do some more layers on your legs. Um, in super cold conditions, I would consider a, a pair of fleece pants. So a synthetic fleece or a wool fleece and fleece is just uh, the fibers are spun. So that there's loft to it, right? It's not just a, mm -hmm. a, a, a flat layer. It's a, it's a lofty layer. And so having a fleece pants um, with a shell over it. So now one of the great things about fleece is it's breathable. It's highly breathable. So as you sweat, as your legs sweat, it's going to move that moisture off your legs and move it towards the outer layer. And if you put, uh, just fleece pants on though, they're so breathable. If it's windy, that wind is just going to go right through the pants and you're going to be cold. Yeah, yeah. So putting a pair of, uh, shell pants or some sort of, you know, more robust layer on the outside is going to hold the warmth 
that your legs produce, but also let the moisture pass through. And we'll talk about breathability of the shell fabric here in just a bit. But the technology is amazing because what you're doing is you're creating this microclimate where against your skin, it's warm and dry. And um, that's, that's perfect, right? That's what you want. Uh, obviously, if it gets hot, you can take off that outer layer and let the fleece breathe better. And then if it gets really hot, you take off the fleece pants and put on a pair of shorts, right? Or just go in your underwear if that's what you want. I, I was going to say, you know, let's let's not complicate things. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on where you are, that might be just fine. Well, uh, you know, and, and and again, like like the, this this sort of goes against my common sense brain, which is like, ooh, it's going to be really cold. Maybe I need some fleece lined jeans. Uh -huh. but that's like, yep. like, like that sounds like the worst thing I could do if there's any chance that they're going to get wet. Right. Yes. Um, even if there's no precipitation, they're going to get wet because they're fleece lined. So you're, the fleece is pulling the moisture off your legs and putting it right into the, the jeans, right into the cotton part of the jeans. Right into the cotton. Gotcha. Yeah. So, you know, and you know this, Jeff, but I'm, I have training as a wilderness first responder. And one of the first things they taught us was somebody's wearing jeans, they're coming off. You know, any type of emergency, the jeans are going to be a problem. Just... <laughs> Jeans, jeans go away. And I'll do this. I'll be out on a hike and I'll see people in jeans and I'll be like, unless we're like, you know, you're going to take in, people's jeans off on a hike. No, I'm not going to take them That's off. Rude. I, I'm going to look down. I'm going to look down on them and be like, I got to watch. Okay. This person. So if they're in my group, for instance, and we're doing a workshop and, I, and we're out doing a hike or we're doing a walk or it's, and there's any chance of it being wet, if they're wearing jeans, I'm just going to watch them closer because they're at risk. Um, <laughs> if they're not people I know, and I just encounter them on the trail and I see them in jeans, I just think, yeah, you just don't really know what you're doing. Um, so it's just, which is terrible because I wear jeans all the time. You do, but you know what, Jeff, you're smart enough because you grew up in Idaho, right? You're smart enough to know that jeans are totally appropriate when you're wrestling those doggies, right? When you're, when you're bringing in the cattle <laughs> exactly, <laughs> or you're out there moving your sheep herd or whatever it is you guys do in <laughs> Southern Idaho. <laughs> uh, I'm wrangling. When I'm wrangling all the potatoes, <laughs> when you're wrangling all the potatoes, jeans are great for that. But, um, you know, dear, the, the pickup dear listener, isn't far away. The pickup isn't far away. <laughs> dear listeners, I was probably the most city kid of Idaho city kids that there is. So <laughs> just just to shatter all the expectations here. <laughs> I, don't know, I had a picture of you up on a steed with a big hat and you're you're. Levi's and no. your chaps and all that. So yeah, jeans are really tough. That's why they're popular, right? They're really tough. They're cool looking, but I mm -hmm. tell you, they get wet and they're just, they're, they don't dry. They're not going to ever dry on your body. Um, mm -hmm. Unless you're way out in the desert and the sun is beating down on you, <laughs> you know, they're just not going to dry. <laughs> so stay away from jeans on those lower legs, um, especially okay. when you're, when you're hiking and doing outdoor photography, please. Gotcha. Okay, so, so let me ask this question. On a typical situation when you're out shooting, how many layers are you going to wear or, or bring with you? I mean, is that going to be completely dependent on the situation, which I guess kind of invalidates the question. But like, like, for example, I am most comfortable when I'm wearing some sort of a shirt and then like an overshirt. And that can be either a mm -hmm. lightweight thing or a fleece like what I'm wearing now. And if I know it's going to be cold, maybe I will have some sort of, um, you know, Under Armour, uh, like thermal layer, mm -hmm. um, you know, but like, is there any sort of good hard and fast rule that says, you know what, you, you should just be prepared to have four layers and they should be synthetic, et cetera, et cetera. I think three is the magic number. Three is the magic okay. number for, for layers. Now we're talking about the upper body. For the lower body, I think three is too much in most situations. Now, um, my wife is, a, is somebody who's cold a lot outside. And so she'll wear a base layer over her legs that is thin, right? We've talked about that base layer. So a wicking base layer, mm -hmm. like tights, yoga pants, that sort of thing. And then over that, she'll put a pair of fleece pants. And then over that, she'll put a shell to, to block the wind or to block the rain. And so in people like that, they get cold easily. Um, three layers is totally appropriate for the legs. 
me two layers is probably the most I'll do in most situations. Yeah. Now, um, for the upper body though, three is great because you have your base layer, that wicking layer, which doesn't provide any insulation at all. It, it, it's not going to keep you warm at all. Its job is to move moisture off your skin or to protect your skin from the sun, right? That's its main job. The second layer is the insulation layer. So if we're talking about cold situations, um, this is the layer that does the work of keeping you warm. And it is oftentimes fleece or puffy. So those are the two ways to go. If you go with fleece, which is... Um, one of the nice thing about fleece is it's low profile. It's not as thick as a puffy coat. So you're not all bulged out. Um, it is, it works well under a backpack, that sort of thing. It's not going to get all compressed and, and not do its job. Um, but the downsides of fleece, one is it's not, uh, windproof. So if it's your, it's also going to serve as your outer layer, you're going to get kind of chilled if it's breezy. The second part that I, for me as a photographer that I don't like about fleece is, um, <laughs> it tends to build up a lot of static charge if it's really dry. So fleece oh. actually can build up static electricity because there's all these fibers. And so you'll be walking and you're kind of arms brushing against your side and you go to touch something and it gives you a little electric shock, right? A little <laughs> so in dry climates, um, I tend to go with a puffy coat. And so if it's cold and dry, almost always down or some sort of th synthetic high loft puffy jacket, is a great way to go. The other great thing about puffy coats over fleece is there might be a time where you decide that it's gotten warm enough, you don't need that mid layer anymore and you're gonna take it off. Um, you go to stuff that puffy coat into your camera bag, it's gonna compress way down and fit in there, no problem. The fleece jacket, much more bulky, hard, fleece doesn't compress well. So I tend to, these days, I tend to go with a puffy mid layer um, and that will be, uh, it could be a vest. It could be uh, just a pullover puffy or a cardigan style puffy. And um, I really do like the hoodies. So this is where I bring in a hood and I don't often wear um, a hood up all the time, but if the wind is out, I want to keep my ears warm and not wear a stocking cap, that sort of thing. The hood is right there on the puffy coat and I just flip it up and it's so nice. And I, I find myself more and more using those hoods. So I would highly urge anybody that's getting that mid layer. If you're getting a puffy coat, get a hood with it, get a hoodie puffy coat. Um, it, it will, it'll be worth having that, that hood when you need it. Um, okay. So, yeah. So let me ask this question because I, I love this puffy coat that I got and it's, it's funny because, you know, I've lived in Seattle for a very long time and I didn't have a puffy coat and I sort of felt like I was violating some ordinance yeah right because in seattle <laughs> like like you got to have a puffy coat you got to drive a subaru the, the whole thing i as we've mentioned before i am a seattle cliche to the end yeah. but puffy coat is great right um because i've been able to pack it down in so many situations even when i was in washington dc for example uh you know morning shoot i was it was really cold at the beginning, warmed up, packed it away, and then I didn't have to think about it, which is great. So this this coat, is this, I, I think of this as an outer layer, but it's not a, an outer layer or it, it, it works both ways. It's very versatile. It, it will do both jobs. Okay. Now, um, here's the thing to keep in mind with puffy coats, because not all puffy coats are equal. Um, so right. the one you have is synthetic fill. It's not down mm -hmm. and it's got a nice, um, real lightweight outer layer that has a, I'm going to throw an acronym out there. Cause we're talking about technology. It has a DWR durable water repellent coating. Okay. And so it'll take a little bit of rain, but not like a pouring rainstorm. So yeah, I've, I've learned that. Yeah. <laughs> so for most <laughs> of us, um, especially here in the Northwest, I would really strongly encourage people not to get a down puffy coat, but to get a synthetic puffy coat. And here's a couple things to keep in mind. Down is feathers, right? It's a natural material, but once those feathers get wet, either from your sweat or from rain, um, they clump up and they no longer have any insulated properties. They, you're mm -hmm. now just wearing this bag of wet feathers, which 
it feels just like it sounds like a bag of wet feathers. That sounds gross. <laughs> um, and it takes a long time for that to dry. So if you have synthetic material, it's better at wicking moisture away. So again, that base layer, right? We're talking about the system. The base layer is moving moisture off your skin. You're out there hiking along, pumping up the, the calories. And the sweat travels into that puffy layer. If that is synthetic, that synthetic stuff will wick it right to the outside. And the, the shells of those jackets are breathable and it'll transport it through and you'll have, um, you know, that's that moisture evaporating away and just and going away from you, which is what you want. Now, down jacket is a little more problematic. Now, down jackets compress better than synthetic fill jackets. Mm. Down jackets are warmer ounce per ounce than synthetic fill jackets, but I think the trade-offs aren't worth it, right? Um, now they do make jackets that have down in them that have a really good breathable waterproof outer shell, um, which will keep the down dry, but you still have to think about how much moisture you're putting in from the inside, right? And so yeah. uh, I, to answer your question, Jeff, yes, a puffy coat can be both your mid insulative layer and your outer protective layer, but it's got to be made well-made. It's got to be a really good uh, puffy coat that's designed to move that moisture through. Um, not some cheap thing you got down at the, you know, down at the gap. <laughs> so um, <Right. laughs> it, you know, th these things are engineered. We're talking about high technology. We're talking about people who are, you know, using microscopes to look at the fibers in there and make sure that they're hollow. So they hold warm air and they keep you warm, but they are also hydrophobic, right? They're going to move water off of that that fiber and not hang on to it. You know, it's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. I, I love this stuff. Um, so I'm a big <laughs> fan of synthetic mid layers that have a hood that also have a durable water repellent shell on the outside. So if I don't want to wear a raincoat over it, uh, maybe it's, you know, too warm for that, or it's not raining enough for that. I have the option of using that puffy mid layer as my outer layer as well. So your jacket's gotcha. perfect example of that. Very, very, um, well-engineered coat for, for those uses. Now let's talk about coatings a little bit. Let's talk about the outer parts of these jackets. So whether you're talking about a puffy jacket or a shell, like a raincoat, um, almost all of them nowadays are not going to be just a sheet of plastic right, that doesn't breathe. They're going to be some sort of breathable material. And Gore-Tex is the trade name that most people associate with this sort of thing. Um, what this is, and this is really fascinating science, what these coats use is a series of layers uh, of material to, that are bonded together, that are glued together um, in, in the process of making these. Uh, the inside material is some sort of wicking protective layer. In the middle is the microporous membrane, which is a Basically, if you could picture like a really stretchy, very super thin sheet of like rubber <laughs> that has tiny, tiny little okay. holes in it, tiny, tiny little holes all over it. And then the outside layer is some sort of ripstop, usually nylon, that is going to protect the inside layers. Um, it's also going to pr provide some... Um, water repellent properties. And so that outer layer is going to be coated with a durable water repellent, a DWR. And so any precipitation that lands on that outer fabric is not going to be um, easily absorbed into the fabric. You won't wet out, it'll beat up and roll off, right? But the moisture that's coming from the inside, right? Your sweat is going to be driven out. It's going to hit that inside layer and it's going to sit up against the membrane. And the heat that you're generating is going to force those water molecules through the pores of the membrane into the outer layer, which will wick it out and evaporate. So that's why these are breathable, right? This is where it gets fun. If you're out <laughs> hiking and you're pumping up a lot of energy and you're pumping up a lot of heat and you generate a lot of sweat, but you're also generating a lot of heat, if you've got a good wicking base layer, a good wicking and insulative mid layer, and this shell on the outside, all of this moisture is going to just fly right through those layers and head to the outside and evaporate out. And you're going to be really comfortable. It's going to work really, really well. When you stop and you get to your location and you zip up because it's cold and it's rainy and you're standing there behind your camera, um, 
the moisture, the heat is going to start to come down, right? Your furnace is, you're turning your thermostat down. If you haven't right. evacuated all the moisture in those layers yet, it's just going to stop. It's, it's, it has no mechanism pushing it out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Maybe not. Um, so how do you, well, I'm just thinking of this sort of like sudden clamminess. So, so what do you do? Unzip and, and evaporate, you know, that's why Air I, dry. I, I, okay. it's like a pump and dump thing, right? So <laughs> you're gonna, as soon as you get to where you're going and you're still real warm, unzip, flap everything around. If you can take the outer shell off, if it's not raining, you can take that outer shell off, let those lower level shells, the mid, level, the mid layer and the base layer, let that dry out. Then you can throw everything back on and you'll be much happier. So it only takes a few minutes to do that. Uh, if the sun is out, this is great. It happens really quickly. Um, if it's breezy, obviously all these things add up to this happening very quickly. As soon as you start to feel cool and dry, throw that outer shell back on and build up the heat inside, but now it's dry. And that's what you want, this microclimate that you've created. Now I wanna add a note about Gore-Tex because this is where people, you know, in the Northwest here, we kind of live and die by this, this, this material. And it comes in different names. So Gore-Tex is a proprietary technology. There's also event fabrics and, you know, every company's got their own brand now or their own, their own name for this microporous membrane. But they all work basically the same. And the, the trick here is, having the hot on the inside, cool on the outside so that the transfer of moisture comes through those pores. If you're in a hot and clammy climate, so I always love seeing this, um, you know, hurricane season, you see the weather channel, those guys are out and, you know, guys and gals are out and they, they've got your, their, their raincoats on and they're all zipped up. That's a gourd, if that's a microporous membrane jacket and it's pouring down rain and it's like 90 degrees and really humid, it's doing nothing that those pores work the other direction too. If it's hotter on the outside than it is on the inside <laughs> or it's close, the water's just gonna move through the jacket, through those pores. And so unless you build up some heat and push it back out, it's just gonna come in. And so people will get wet wearing a really nice, you know, very expensive Gore-Tex jacket. They'll get wet and if the temperature difference isn't great between inside and outside, does that make sense? So it's uh, tricky. It, it does, but it sounds like you're sort of stuck. Like, what do you do then? Uh, you go old tech. This is where if you're going to be standing around in a warm, a um, oh, couple things. Are you going to get cold if it's 90 degrees and raining? Probably not. So maybe you don't need a rain jacket. Mm -hmm. Maybe just get wet because you're going to be wet anyway. <laughs> you know, you're okay. just wet and warm. You know, it's like going swimming. It's not totally awful. So maybe wearing your, your base layer that's wicking and you just let it get wet, or you have a, like a nylon shirt over the top and let it get wet. The other way to go is you get a hard shell that is not breathable. And so basically like a garbage bag, not a, literally a garbage bag, but a polyurethane right. <laughs> coated old style raincoat that like the commercial fishermen wear these, right? They're completely impervious to moisture. There's no, there's yeah. no breathability. Um, that's great for these, you know, situations. Now, if I'm going out to take photos and I'm driving to my location, I'm not going to get the chance to build up a lot of heat, uh, in hiking to my location. I'll oftentimes use this type of shell because, uh, if it's raining and cold, I'm not going to have the heat to push that moisture out of a microporous membrane jacket. So I'll go with a, uh, totally waterproof solution. And there's a couple of brands that I'll put in the show notes, but one is uh, Columbia Sportswear and, and Mountain Hardware is part of that company. They have a thing called OutDry, which is where they put a thick layer of waterproof material on the outside of the jackets. Uh, another one, uh, Patagonia makes a set of commercial rain gear for commercial fishermen and farmers and people who are out just working in the rain um, th that works really, really well. But I'll put some links in the show notes. Uh, these types of jackets are great if you're not generating a lot of heat on the inside. As soon as you start hiking and stuff, they're just going to hold the moisture in and hold the heat in and they get kind of miserable pretty quickly. Mm. Um, well, you know, those jogging suits, right? You've seen these training suits that are basically look like rubber and people put them on and they, they jog in them so that their temperature gets really high and they basically sweat more. <laughs> oh yeah. Kind of a torture suit, but that's, that's the same, <laughs> that's the same idea. 
same idea. So, <laughs> so we've talked about these three layers, get wicking base layer, insulative mid layer, mm -hmm. uh, and protective outer layer, all working together to move moisture away from you, hold heat in and keep you from getting wet from the outside. If it's raining or snowing or whatever, uh, that's a lot, but, uh, how about, how about our heads? <laughs> You know, everybody wants to put on a big old stocking cap when it's cold out. And there's an old adage uh, in outdoor activities that, that you lose 90% of your heat through the top of your head. Have you heard that before? Oh, yeah. Like when you're a kid. Yeah. Totally bunk. Totally not true. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, not true at all. Not true at all. Whatever the top of your head is percentage wise of your body, that's the amount of heat you'll lose. Just the same as the back of your hands or, you know your arm whatever it's not extra special but, it just feels heat that way. goes up he does go and, up and i'm <laughs> it go and up. i'm starting to thin back there so clearly <laughs> it's like a chimney oh, bop, 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 bop. you know um <laughs> the thing is with hats is it, our ears our ears are really temperature sensitive um yeah and so for a lot of times if it's cold out i'll wear a stocking cap to protect my ears um but you need to know that covering your head is not going to make you warm if you're cold, <laughs> right? It's, it's not, you know, it's just, it's just not going to be enough. So you have to combine it with the, the outer layers and the mid layers down on your, the rest of your body, but a good hat is very important. And I always carry a wool Merino wool stocking cap in my camera bag, um, except in the deepest parts of summer. But even then, there are sure. times I'm up in the mountains in the summertime and in the morning, it's cold. You throw that on. It's just nice to have that. Um, you also would like to keep your head uh, protected from the sun. That's a big thing for those of us with hair that's not as robust as it used to be. Um, <laughs> so for me, a hat is really important about sun protection. And I, I actually didn't mention sun protection. I'm wearing a sun hoodie. So uh, this oh, is my right. summer jacket. So it has no insulation at all. It's very thin. It's stretchy. It doesn't, it doesn't have any waterproof ability, right? If it gets rain on it, the rain's just going to soak right in. It's designed to be really highly breathable and provide sun protection because I don't like sunscreen. So I have this, it's kind of geeky, right? But I have this hood and I'll zip this up. If, it, if I'm out on the beach in Hawaii, <laughs> I'll have this on with maybe a ball cap underneath and I'm, I'm, uh -huh got my sunglasses on. I look kind of like the Unabomber. I'm all bundled up. Um, <laughs> and what I'm doing is I'm not trying to stay warm. It's actually it helps me stay cool because it's keeping the sun off my skin and it's letting all yeah. that moisture out because it's breathable. But a sun hoodie is a critical piece of gear for me in the summertime. I'm just not somebody who likes to wear a lot of sunscreen. It gets in my eyes, makes me, makes me cranky. So yeah. I go with, yeah. I go with a nice wide hat or a hood. Um, and these sun hoodies. So think about that too. Okay. That's part of it. Okay. So th this actually brings up a question I've long had because going back to uh, the, the, like the sort of mid layers, when you're going shopping, there are often a lot of shirts and things that will say they are uh, bug proof and they are UV resistant. Yeah. Now, what's the deal with that? Like, is that just marketing or does that also mean like if it's, if it has some sort of insect repellent built in, I can never wash it. Like what's the deal about that? Because it sounds like fantastic technology, right? It sounds, it also it sounds makes great. me go, what? Yeah. It sounds too good to be true. Right. So if you live in an area where you're dealing with biting insects, mosquitoes are the, are the big ones, right? Um, yeah. there's two things that are going on. One is they've made the shirt and usually they're a button down shirt, right? With a nice collar. Um, they look, they look okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, those are great for sun. They've been built. Usually they're somewhere between you, uh, uh, UPF 50, 30 to 50, somewhere in that range. So like really good, solid sunscreen. Okay. But the weave of the fabric is tight enough that, um, the little, what's that part called of the mosquito they're the little bite the part that pokes into you right the needle doesn't go through that won't go through that part yeah it won't go through that fabric now here's the other thing that's all great but 
when you got a bunch of mosquitoes on you, the fact that they can't get to you through your shirt is nice, but they're going to get to you through, you know, all the open skin that you have, right? Your hands, your feet, your legs, your face. Um, yeah. So one of the things that's really nice, and you can do this with any shirt, it doesn't have to come this way, is there's a material called permethrin. It's a liquid, uh, permethrin. I'll put it in the show notes. You can wash um, anything in it, you know, pants, shoes, socks, tents, jackets, um, whatever. Wash it in permethrin, let it dry. And it's a protein that ticks and mosquitoes can't touch. They, they'll die if they come into contact with it. But it will stay on your clothes for many, many washes. It's usually good for a year or more of washes. Really? And so you won't get, you know, if you do your pants and your socks and you're in tick country, uh, pants and socks and permethrin, once it's dry, it's totally safe for us. It doesn't come in through our skin, but it's toxic to these biting insects that we don't like. So for me, no, no question, the, all the outer layers, all the, the pants, shorts, socks, uh, shoes, you can spray it on your shoes, and let it dry, are going to get permethrin treatment so that it's... Um, uh, protected. Now it's different than DEET, right? DEET is an insect repellent. Permethrin is just toxic to insects. It doesn't, insect repellents block the smell of us from insects. So mosquitoes don't know we're there, I guess. Okay. Um, permethrin doesn't block that. They just come in contact with it and they're like, get away. Right. So as soon as they touch that fabric, they're going to scoot off and, and leave you alone. So I have never heard of this before. It's pretty awesome stuff. Pretty awesome stuff. So I would treat a uh, clothing tents gear like that with permethrin, um, but still use an insect repellent um, on my face and hands because, you know, you can't cover mm -hmm. everything, right? I try in the summertime to cover everything <laughs> from the sun. But uh, now if you're in a really bad this brings me down a tangent, but I, I actually had a really nightmarish experience many, many years ago in the Great Lakes. I was up uh, kayaking and camping for a week in the Apostle Islands in Lake Superior, and we were attacked by black biting flies. And really, Jeff, this you can't write something more horrible than these little things. I mean, you can't conceive. No. Them. So they look like a normal house fly, but they bite you. And when they bite you, no, they, they, no, take no. A little, they, they take a little chunk. When they bite you, they leave a pheromone that tells the other flies, bite right here. <laughs> and so then they'll come on you in a mat. So you'll be standing there and they'll land on you and they'll just be covered like mats of them, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these flies. And we were on this island and they came in and they covered us. And we actually went into the lake up to our necks and stood in the water in the lake. And then like splash water and tried to keep the flies off of us um, and spent hours out there just hanging out <laughs> because it was so bad on land. We'd come back on shore and we'd put on all of our clothes, long pants, long jackets. We had bug shirts. So there's a hood and then like a screen in the front and you could pull okay. your hands inside your sleeves and do all this. And you could stand around, but these flies would come and just land on you because they felt the heat and the, uh, carbon dioxide, I guess it comes off of us. And so they would just cling yeah. to your clothes and just sit there. It was incredibly uncomfortable. So if you're in those types of situations, I, uh, bug repellent, permethrin didn't affect these guys at all. They, you could spray them with hundred percent DEET and they'd be like, mmm, <laughs> good stuff. Um, you could put oh. them yeah, close to a fire and the smoke did nothing. They didn't care about the smoke. They were straight out of hell. They were the worst, wow. the worst bugs I've ever I encountered. Am I am thoroughly creeped out. Thank you. <laughs> it was awful. It was awful. It was far worse than any mosquito encounters I've had in Alaska. It was far worse than anything I've encountered here in the Northwest. Just, just, you know, I've had ticks and leeches and all kinds of stuff on me, but those flies, they were by far the worst because they just bit you and they hurt. Ah, I hate them. So for that, you just, you need screened clothing. You need a bug net over your head. You need um, every piece of exposed flesh needs to be covered up. And so something like this sun hoodie would be great. And then a comet combine it with a bug mm -hmm. net uh, over your head and a good hat. Uh, but it, man, uh, oh, your man. sanity goes away in those types of situations. It's crazy. Okay. Well, this brings me to a transition, which I'm desperate to make to get off of this topic mm -hmm. of the black. Thank <laughs> you. I was bugs. hoping you'd do that. Yeah. 
Oh, thank God. Um, covering up that also includes, let, let's talk about gloves because yeah. gloves seem to be that, that category of there are so many different things, big ones, small ones, electronic touchable ones. Like it almost feels like it could be an episode on its own, but give me the lowdown on gloves. Gloves are really fascinating, especially for photographers, because we have to be able to have you know, really fine dexterity to manipulate some of the buttons and dials on our cameras. Plus we now have touch screens mm -hmm. on everything, right? So having gloves that have those little touch screen surfaces on the fingertips uh, allows us to operate touch screens without um, taking the gloves off, which is nice. I mm -hmm. sort of follow the same conventions when it comes to gloves as I do with my other layers. I have a lightweight layer against my skin and usually that's merino wool. And then I'll have a, a warmer insulative shell layer that goes over the outside. And so if it's really cold out, I'll put on this nice, tight, lightweight layer, and then I'll put the heavy gloves over that. And if it comes time to do some fine work with my um, camera, I can take off one glove real quick, the shell glove, and use my lightweight glove to manipulate my camera and then put that shell glove back on. There are some companies out there that have done some things that makes this easier. They have mittens that come over the uh, fingertips. And so you can just fold back that flap and use your, use the, your fingers and then cover them back up really quickly. Uh, and then the, you also have this great thing now, which is electric gloves. So they're gloves that have heat coils in them that actually um, heat up. And so you can, they come with a little battery in them and they, they work great. So I think if you're spending a lot of time in really cold environments, um, thinking about electric gloves, because photographers, we're standing around, we're not generating a lot of heat. So our hands get cold, our feet get cold really, really easily. And so uh, these types of things can be incredibly distracting and kill your stoke, right? Kill your creativity. And so having um, nice, warm, dry gloves to put your hands in. Absolutely a must um, for photography. So yeah, that's actually a, uh, the lightweight gloves or something that's always in my camera bag. They're just, I keep a pair in there, just a stocked item. <laughs> They're just always there. Those and a buff, that's something I didn't talk about. So this tube of merino wool that you wear around your neck. And then when your face gets cold, you can pull it up over your face, over your nose and your, your lower <laughs> lower part of your face. I suppose you could pull it up over your eyes if you really wanted to. Um, but this, you know, something to wear around your neck um, when it's cold to protect your face and stuff from the the, the wind or the, the uh, sun even. Really nice. And so I keep a buff and lightweight gloves in my camera bag all the time. All the time. Because you never know. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, maybe the one thing we haven't, covered or maybe there's like 50 things we haven't covered no. but uh the next thing that comes to mind is uh shoes shoes right. boots um apparently that it, if you get wet shoes your life will be miserable yeah and i can yeah. tell you this out of <laughs> out of experience so um but you know sh shoes is also the type of thing that it's like the worst thing to pack because they take up so much room, especially if you have big feet, like I do, mm -hmm. you know, like I would love to bring my, 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 you know, my boots, my hiking boots, like sometimes that's great, but it, it just takes up so much room. Yeah. And, and they're heavy. So, yeah. They're heavy. And they're heavy. And yeah. So, I mean, I try to bring at least one extra type of shoe, no matter what, because you never know when you're going to get, something wet and they're not necessarily going to dry uh very quickly so you want to have that backup like like you said also having you know backup pair of socks mm -hmm. but like what's your advice in terms of shoes or again is this one of those things where well it depends on where you're going to go right well a lot of it depends on where you're going to go but most of us don't need to go out and buy five different pairs of boots for different situations, right? You'd like to find something that's sort of middle ground that covers a lot of these situations. And so um, yeah. the, you know, talk about technology. This is an area where billions of dollars have been spent in researching and developing uh, shoes that perform well in difficult conditions. And the first question I would ask to someone who is considering getting a pair of boots or shoes for outdoor photography is what sort of terrain are you covering? 
are you going to be walking on trails? Are you going to be climbing on rocks? Are you going to be going along rivers, uh, river sides where the rocks are slippery? Um, you know, are you going to be out in the snow? That is going to dictate number one, that's going to dictate the, the type of boot. Now, um, most of us, when we're out doing photography, we tend to be trail based or close to the trail. So we're not doing scrambling or very extreme, you know, mountaineering type things. And so a very lightweight pair of hiking boots or even, um, trail running shoes are a great option. Most of the time we're not carrying a backpack that weighs 80 pounds, right? <laughs> so, um, having <laughs> ankle support and all of that is, is optional. Um, I don't feel like I need a lot of ankle support. In fact, it's hard to find boots nowadays that actually provide ankle support. Most of them don't come up high enough to really brace your ankle. Yeah. So they're just sort of there and it's like, well, what's, what's the point? Um, and so maybe a lower pair of shoes, uh, if, do they need to be waterproof? Are you going to be doing, um, you know, wet weather photography? You know, in that case, you want to look for something that's waterproof and most of the good boots out there just come that way. That's just naturally, they have a, a Gore-Tex membrane, some sort of membrane in them that keeps them dry. So all that said, here's what I would do. Here's what I do. Um, in most situations, I'm wearing tennis shoes, you know, trail runner tennis shoes. So they're tennis shoes that have a tread on the bottom that's good for uneven ground, gravel, dirt, some rocks, a good mixed terrain type of type of shoe. They're sticky. So the rubber on the bottom is not real hard. So when you're walking on rocks, it's, it clings to the rocks. So that's really important. Um, I do prefer to have something that is nice and breathable. So my feet don't get too hot because my feet get hot really easily. So uh, I don't always get waterproof ones, but my latest pair of hiking boots is actually waterproof. And then I look for support. You know, I have flat feet. And so I like to have good, nice wide shoe that helps my foot uh, stay in its natural shape. I've found more and more as I get older, I walk a lot. Um, I'm really drawn towards shoes that have a nice wide footbed. So whatever your shape of your foot, find a shoe company that makes shoes that really are tailored for your type of foot because it's not one size fits all. So the brands that I really like are Ultra Running, which is a, a running shoe company that makes a really wide shoe. Some Keen shoes, although my last three pairs of Keens I've sent back because I they've changed something about Keen shoes, they used to fit me really well. Now they don't. And there's a new one. Then my latest pair of boots is by a company called Innovate. Um, but you got to shop around. You got to go try these on. Don't buy them on online. Just, just go for it. <laughs> try them on, walk around for a while before you head out on your trip. The last thing I would mention is um, if you're going to be dealing with snow, uh, that's where maybe a specialty pair of boots that has insulation in it uh, is going to help. Because you even if you have nice, thick, warm wool socks on, if there's no insulation in the boots, uh, you're going to get cold in the snow. Your feet are going to get cold. Mm -hmm. So you have to bulk up a little bit there. I actually, Jeff, have a pair of bunny boots is what they're called. They're military uh, issue. I bought them when I lived in Alaska 25 years ago. They're big rubber okay. boots and they, um, they have a valve on the outside and you actually pump them up with air. You pump them up with a bike pump. And they uh, are super, super warm. They're meant for Arctic conditions. But when you put them on, you look like a bunny because they're big and round. <laughs> so they call them bunny <laughs> boots. Um, and I actually put them on this last winter. I went out and, and wore them because I hadn't worn them in years. And they were incredibly heavy, incredibly heavy, but totally warm. So you know, oh, wow. they make some pretty amazing um, technology these days isn't quite so heavy. But yeah. All right. So I need to go find my moon boots. Yeah, moon boots. Yeah. So think about how we dressed as kids. And we both grew up in climates with snow, right? We would have these moon boots, which are just nylon floppy boots, right? Full of insulation, totally yep. not waterproof. All insulation. Yeah, not <laughs> waterproof. And so if you were like me, Jeff, you put your feet in, you put your wool socks on, then you put bread bags over your feet and then you put them in the moon boots, right? Is that what you did? Yeah. You would do the bread yeah. bag thing? Yeah, of course. So that's an option, not bread bags. I'm not going to suggest bread bags, but they do make <laughs> Gore-Tex socks. And so if you're, if your favorite pair of boots is not waterproof and you're going out and you're going to be in the water or you're going to be in a really rainy conditions, you can get Gore-Tex socks that work really, really well. Mm. Um, and those will keep your feet dry 
because once your feet get wet more than any other part of your body, if your feet get wet and they stay wet all day, you're going to get what's called immersion foot, which is where your tissue gets like bathtub, right? Your, your skin gets all pruney <laughs> and you're going to have problems oh. with your feet. You're going to have problems with circulation. You're going to have problems with your feet staying um, warm. And it's a, it's a health problem. It can become a, a risk to your, to your feet, to the nerves and stuff in your feet. So having great shoes is number one priority. It, you know, you really need to think about your feet and spend some money. It's, it's an investment, but you know, we've all been there where you're out on that viewpoint and the sun is coming up and it's glorious. And all you can think about is how miserable you are. And that's where you're like, I would pay so much for a good pair of shoes right now. <laughs> <laughs> I could have, I could have paid so much yeah. and had good shoes and not, not be dealing with this right now. Oh yeah. Yes. We've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> all right. What have we missed? We've got, I'm just sort of going like top to bottom. Uh, you know, we've, we've got hats, gloves, boots, um, you know, well, bags, that's an entirely other Yeah, that's a whole uh, topic, other whole always. Other topic, whole other topic. That's a whole other thing. Um, synthetics, uh, I don't know, like sunglasses, those can be important, I guess. Sun sunglasses are important. I, you know, I struggle with sunglasses because, you know, both of us wear glasses. We've, you know, referenced back yeah. to our earlier episode with Dr. Eye Health, right, about glasses. Yes. Um, one of the things I would that I have discovered about my modern cameras with the, you know, LC, the EVF being uh, such a nice thing on a sunny day, being mm -hmm. able to look in there and, and focus and check my focus and all that good stuff uh, is it's, I can't actually use my EVF very well with my glasses on. And so one of the things I've realized is I wear prescription sunglasses, um, <laughs> but I can't, I don't want to push my prescription sunglasses up against the eye cup because then I'm going to get eye cup smudge all over my glasses. And so I just put a right. little pair of, of croquis, little strings on your glasses. So I can just pop them off yeah. and they're hanging there. I don't wear them on my glasses all the time, but when I'm going out to do photography, I keep it this, this little mm -hmm. croquis string in my camera bag and I pop them on my sunglasses or even my regular glasses if it's not sunny. That way, when it's time for me to do my work, I can take my glasses off without having to put them down somewhere, like in a pocket or right. in a camera bag where they're going to get broken. I'm, I've spent a lot on these glasses, so I want to keep them close and keep them safe. So I would add that to our list is a set of, if you wear glasses, a set of croquis um, to uh, <laughs> protect your glasses from getting all scratched and beat <laughs> up and greasy. Uh, but yeah, sunglasses are super important. You don't want to damage your eyes. Um, when you're outdoors yeah. and, and my uh, optometrist has suggested that anytime I'm outside, I should be wearing sunglasses. You know, the, the amount of damage yeah. that is done to your eyes from the sun is pretty, pretty scary. So uh, I try to remember to switch out. Not always good. About that. All right. I guess the only thing left is, you know, what, what kind of necktie to wear when you're out? Well, that, you know, that's, that's totally fashion. That's up to each individual, Jeff. I prefer bow ties. <laughs> I actually do have a bow tie. I hate to admit that. I, I do want to say though, that this, all this stuff is expensive. We were talking about um, yeah. high tech gear. This is not, you're not going to run down to um, you know, Walmart and get uh, a good set of this stuff. You need to invest in good gear. You need to go try this stuff on. You need to talk to people at the store that know what they're talking about. So maybe the best way to wrap this up is to talk about where to get this gear. If you yes. are um, in a metropolitan area, anywhere in the country, you can usually find an REI, uh, Recreational Equipment Incorporated. Uh, there are um, other, other chain stores out there that do outdoor gear, but almost every town has a really good outdoor gear store. And um, when you go in there, the brands that you want to look for, if you see these brands, you'll know that you're dealing with good stuff. I'm a big fan of Patagonia. Um, I'm wearing an outdoor research OR that's your jacket too, is outdoor research out of Seattle. Mm -hmm. Um, REI's oh, brand. Are they? Yeah. <laughs> REI's brand, their, their house brand is really good. Um, there's, there's a, you know, those are the kind of the big brands I look for mountain hardware. If you have tons of money and you want to be on the cutting edge of technology, Arcteryx out of Vancouver, BC, um, makes some incredible clothing. 
um, but they're incredibly expensive. Fall Raven, I mentioned before, that Swedish company, also very expensive, but very well-built uh, equipment. And so look for those brands, uh, Marmot, I could name off a whole bunch, right? So look for those brands. If you see them, then you're in a good shop and the people there are going to know what they're talking about. So try stuff on, see if the fit works for you um, and get good set of layers, base layer, mid layer, outer layer, tops and bottoms, hats, gloves, socks, shoes, you'd be set. And the next time you go out and the weather's being rough, that's when you get the really great, amazing, dramatic photos. You can stand there smugly in your protective gear and say, I'm out here doing this <laughs> and I'm not uncomfortable. It's pretty special. Yeah, that makes a big difference. Also, uh, one thing that you pointed out to me in the past is if you do have a store like REI or anything like that, uh, the first thing I do now is head to the back corner of the store and see what their clearance rack is. Because I have found actually a, a few good deals on uh, like, like my, my lightweight rain shell. Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, 50% off in a, in an outlet store. Yeah. And it's great. And it packs down and it's rainproof and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I know just by knowing you, you have this freakish sixth sense for getting good outdoor gear at ridiculous discounts. Yes. So that's it's a skill I've developed so, over years. Um, so yeah, yeah, always go to the back, look at the clearance rack, check out outlets. So every every company I've mentioned, whether it be Mountain Hardware, Patagonia, whatever, um, if you go to their website, there's usually a web special or outlet. And a lot of these companies have moved their outlet stuff onto their websites. And so, um, you know, look in their outlet, see if the items that you tried on at the store are, are there for, for sale. Wait for sales. Every big company has uh, seasonal sales. So usually at the end of a season, you'll find a sale. You can jump on and get 20 to 50% off usually this stuff. I hate paying full price for clothing. And I, I refuse to. So I, you know, I'm always shopping these racks <laughs> and always shopping these sales. But you have to be opportunistic um, and look for these things. Now there are these outlet malls all over the place, and there are some of these brands that you'll find at outlet malls. Um, not all of them, you know, all not all of the outdoor gear you find at outlet malls are good, but look for the brands. So if you see a North Face or Arcteryx or um, you know Mountain Hardware outlet. Uh, you know, that's a good opportunity to get some good stuff at a good price. So yeah. look for that. But online is probably your best bet. You just got to go try this stuff on in a real store first. That's where I love REI. Also, um, most places have return policies, right? Uh, even with outlet things, you can return them. So you can always get a bunch of stuff and return the things that don't fit or don't feel right. Uh, just be good to that stuff. Don't, don't abuse it. I was in REI yesterday, speaking of. And they have um, what they call their their uh, attic, I think is their outlet, what they call their outlet in the store. And it's return stuff. And there was a pair of boots on the shelf that were my size. And so it, they caught my eye and I was looking at them and they were returned by a customer because the left heel had started falling off. And I looked at those boots and it looked like they had been worn for years, like years. <laughs> And I'm like, who wears a pair of boots for years? And then they're like, well, it looks like they're falling apart. I'm going to take them back to REI and get my money back. <laughs> but a lot of these yeah. places do have lifetime warranties. So keep that in mind. But don't abuse yeah. it. Yeah. Don't be that person. <laughs> yeah. So, so there are options for getting this stuff at reasonable prices. Yes, it, it's going to be more expensive. But, um, you know, let's, let's put this into perspective you might, you know, throw $500 down for a lens and not think about it. So mm -hmm. maybe if you don't need that lens, I know that's almost heresy to say so, but yeah. maybe you take that money, you put it into some clothing and you're going to be all the better off so that the next time you're out, you are focused on what you're doing and what you're shooting. And I mean, because ultimately the idea is you don't have to think about any of this stuff. You don't have to think about it because you're comfortable and you're focused on your photography and you're not, you know, bulked down. It just 
works. And then later on, you can be like, wow, that was a really great choice that I made because everybody around me was freezing their butts off and I was all nice and comfy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it, I think of this stuff as photography gear, you know, it, I really can't be a photographer unless I'm dressed properly for the conditions. So it's photography gear and I, it's an investment and I have to take care of it. You know, I have to wash the stuff properly. I have to make sure it's not just wadded up wet on my floor and leave it there like my son likes to do. <laughs> right. So you have to take care of this stuff just like you would your camera gear because it's high tech, um, it's high tech devices that we're using. So again, um, we're going to have all of this stuff kind of collected up in the show notes and I'll put a bunch of links in there for you so you can find these things and suggested base layers, suggested mid layers and suggested outer layers. So check out photocombobulate.com for all of that and our past episodes. If you are subscribed to the podcast, we sure appreciate that. We would love it if you wrote a review on whatever podcast app you use. Uh, if you would like to leave a comment for us, you can also do that at the photocombobulate.website. There's a contact page. Uh, and you can also comment on the show notes page if you'd like. Did I miss anything there, Jeff? No, no. Uh, we we love all of that. Oh, uh, yes, you did. Um, there is, uh, most of the time, um, it, a video version of this podcast yes. at our YouTube site, which is also linked at photocombobulate.com. Mm -hmm. And it's lightly edited. And if you want to ask, see us talk about these things, um, you know, it's a lot better to see us because we're friendly, happy guys who gesticulate a lot. So we do. We're uh, pretty but, wild to watch. <laughs> But basically, you have lots of options, and we appreciate that you're spending the time. Thank you. Plus, for this particular episode, it's the rare opportunity to see you in a tie. I don't know if I've ever seen you I in know, a tie isn't before. I know. that crazy? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe well, when we graduated college. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I even worked. Maybe I did. Maybe I did. <laughs> well, thanks for listening, everybody, and we will see you on the next episode. And I'm going to go out on the limb here Jeff and say that we're going to follow this theme a little bit and talk about camping so maybe oh, let's yeah. talk about camping talk about using this stuff yeah oh so. using this stuff wait not just buying it and, and hoarding it and leaving it in a closet yeah buying oh, no, it, take, sorry. taking it out once so we can get photos of ourselves in it and put it on our, our profile <laughs> pictures right uh. There are different types of photographers. There are photographers totally. who buy a lot of stuff and don't use it. And there are photographers who don't buy a lot of stuff and use it into the ground. So, yeah, yes. it all works. It all all works. right. Thanks, buddy. Take care, bud. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.